Hi, uh, my name is Jussi. Uh, we're going to talk about the containers and the water problem. Um, the, I'm co-authoring this with Martha. Um, so there's a Die Hard puzzle in the movie Die Hard. Um, there's a, a puzzle where you're given a, a five gallon jug and a three gallon jug and infinite supply of water uh, coming from a, from a faucet. You have to measure uh, five, uh, four gallons. And uh, Bruce Willis and uh, Samuel L. Jackson are playing this movie. Um, and uh, you have to do this with a, a sequence of successive um, uh, pourings. You have to pour from the from one jug to another one. You, you may pour it to the ground. You may uh, refill them. But the, the goal is to measure four gallons of water. And for this, there is a data structure uh, that actually we didn't come up with this. I'm going to give credit to the person who came up with it in the next few pages. Uh, so there's a data structure um, that uh, helps us uh, come up uh, with a solution. So this data structure, we have uh, the red lines represent the contents of the of the five gallon jug. So you see there's a red zero, red one. That means here the red uh, red container has one uh, zero gallons of water, one gallon of water, two gallons of water, all the way to five gallons of water. The horizontal blue lines represent the uh, amount of water in the three gallon jug. So this is zero gallons. That's the blue zero. Uh, blue one means one gallons all the way to three gallons. So that's the data, data structure that we have. And, uh, and then there's, uh, there's some kind of uh, um, steps that you can take or you can pour water on the, on the data structure. So for example, this red arrow means that you go from the red uh, container having two gallons and the blue having zero, so two comma zero, and you end up here at zero comma two, which means that you pour from the red into the blue. You start with two comma zero, end up with zero comma two, or you pour from four comma zero, so the red had four gallons in it, and zero in the blue, all the way to one three, right? So this, this operation is pouring from uh, red to blue. Uh, this operation is pouring from blue to red. So for example, here we have three gallons in the blue uh, container, zero in the red one, and here we ha uh, have three in the red and zero in the, in the blue container. Um, and here, uh, on the horizontally, we have uh, action of, uh, um, emptying or filling the red, uh, the red uh, container either from the faucet or pouring it on the ground. So for example, here, here we have 0, 2, which means the red is empty, uh, and then we fill it with the water from the faucet, we end up at 5, 2. Or the other direction, let's say here we are 5, 1, and we pour the contents of the red container on the ground, we end up at 0, 1. Um, and this one is a similar operation on the on the blue container, uh, you can uh, go from three comma three, so three on the on the blue, and if you pour it on the ground, you end up at three zero. So you empty the the blue container, uh, or you fill the blue container from the faucet. So you started with maybe one comma zero, and it ended up at one comma three. Um, so the puzzle is that we start at zero zero. So both containers are empty. We do have the faucet that provides us infinite amount of water. And we have to end up somewhere where there's a four. So it's either here, which is four comma zero, or four comma three, right? Um, now, on the periphery of this uh, data structure, uh, either a container is emptied or filled. So when we, uh, so that, that's when we know that some action happened. Uh, when the container is, is empty, then we reach the bottom or the left side. When it's filled, we reach the right side or the top side. So, um, so this, uh, this guy, I, kind, I look a little bit like him, but I'm not him. His name is uh, Burka Poster. He does have, a, he's bald, also has glasses, and has an accent. He has a different accent. He has a German accent, I think. Um, and he came up with the data structure I presented in the previous page. Um, and there's a YouTube link here, and you can look for his name, and it's called How Not to Die Hard with Math. And it's a very cool presentation, so I recommend you watch, watch his presentation. So I kind of uh, uh, insp uh, got inspired from his, uh, his present, his YouTube video. So here, uh, let's, let's try to find a solution to this puzzle. So we start at zero, zero, which means both containers are empty. And you can see that both containers are empty. And then we can walk along the lines of this data structure. So we go from here to here. That means we filled the red container to uh, capacity. So now we are at five, zero, it means this has five gallons and this is zero gallons, right? The goal is to reach one of these green dots. And then um, we uh, bounced here to this point. Uh, that means that we, uh, we poured uh, three gallons from the big one to the small one. 
and that's this arrow represented by this arrow and then uh, another step takes us here from 2 comma 3 to 2 comma 0 that means we, means we emptied the, the blue container and then uh, another step here and another step here and another step there and then we we found a solution so we're basically bouncing like a billiard, like a pool ball or billiards ball along the along this data structure only on the walls because that's when you know that an effective uh, um, action happened and then you end up here or you end up here and that's the solution all right so let's take this to an extra dimension let's go to three dimensions let's say we have uh, three containers of um, um, 30 gallons 21 gallons and 10 gallons and we are changing it a little bit um, such that the the red container is full of water the other one the other two are empty and we want to measure 15 gallons we don't have a, a infinite amount of water so we don't do not have a faucet and we cannot pour it to the ground so the sum of the liquid in all of these three containers has to be always 30. So um, I, I wrote a little program to actually compute a solution for, to this problem. So I start, I start at 30, 0, 0, which means the red one is full. The 21 and 10 gallon containers are empty. And then we pour uh, 9 gallons, uh, excuse me, 21 gallons from the red one to the blue one. So we end up at 9, 21, 0, 9, 20, 9 11, 10, and so on after 30 some number of steps, we end up at 15, 15, 0. So we did reach our goal of measuring 15 gallons of water. The question is how would you come, how would you compute this uh, complicated number of steps on uh, paper and pencil? It's, it's really, really difficult. Um, of course, you can have a whole category of this kind of problems. You can have different volumes. Uh, you can search for 16 instead of 15. You can search for 17. You can come up with your own numbers, right? Um, now, when I plotted this in 3D, it turns out that all of these points uh, uh, are bouncing on a 45 degree tilted roof of a house, kind of. Um, it's kind of hard to see this in 3D. It kind of bounces around, and then that one inspired me to come up with this data structure that represents the data structure to solve this problem with these three volumes. So here we have three colors. The red lines are going from zero one to all the way to 30. So those are representing the amount of water in the 30 gallon container. So again, zero through 30. The 21 is uh, going from, uh, excuse me, the blue one is going from vertical, like tilted to the left, zero gallons, one gallons, two gallons, all the way to 21. Here, there's a 21 blue. And the yellow ones go horizontally, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10 and so on. It's kind of a, a weird shape. It's kind of a parallelogram with a, with a notch here. We'll talk about that, how it came about. Um, so um, there are some properties on this data structure. One is that the, the sum of each of these, uh, for each of the nodes, the sum of the three values is always 30 because we cannot uh, pour the water on the ground. We cannot get more water from a faucet. So we have to preserve the total volume of 30. So no matter where we are at every node, the sum is 30. Um, the other thing is that every node on the border has at least one jug either empty or full. Notice here, the yellow uh, container is empty. Um, and here, the, um, here the blue container is, is empty, right? Um, uh, here, uh, for example, if on the corner, we have two of the containers have to be either empty or full. So for example, here, the red container is empty and the um, yellow container is full. Here, the red container is empty and the blue container is full. And the uh, yellow is not full, it's almost full, but not full. Um, so, uh, and on this data structure, if you move from uh, border to border along the line, uh, you have these events of either emptying or filling a container. So for example, here, if you start at 2280, we end up here. We poured water from the blue container, which had eight into the yellow, and we end up with 20. So we start with 2280, and we end up with 2208. Or in this case, we started with 2010, so 20 gallons in the red, 10 in the blue, and zero in the yellow. We end up here at 10, 10, 10. Um, okay, so that's the source. We start with the 30, so the, the red container is full, the blue is empty and the yellow is empty, and we need to end up at target, which is here. So it's 15 on the blue, 
And 50 on the red, this is the 50 on the blue, 50 on the red. So that's the only possible location that has 50 in um, that will work for us. So we need to bounce from this uh, pink dot to this green dot. Um, about the shape of this data structure, uh, once you have the grid, so you, you take the red lines, um, 0, 1, 2, all the way to 30, uh, blue ones, 0, 1, all the way to 21, and 0, all the way to 10 on the yellow, uh, you can just walk around and see what is the what is the perimeter that you have to draw in order to uh, maintain the properties that we talked earlier, so such that the each point on the edge or each node on the edge is either uh, one of them is either empty or full, and if it's on a corner, um, if it's on a corner, then uh, two of them have to be either full or empty, and the sum of all of those uh, three volumes is thirty. Uh, or the, uh, the whatever they contain is 30, and this is the shape that comes up with. And if you were to go to this node here, if you were to elongate the blue line, and you would go here, that would not be, uh, satisfy those properties. So this is kind of a uh, naturally forming shape. Um, okay, so again, we have to go from here, which is 30, 0, 0, to end up at 15, 15, 0, right? 0 is on yellow. Um, so this is the solution that I computed with a, a computer program earlier, and I'm highlighting where we are at this point. We are at 30, 0, 0, and I start bouncing the billiards ball uh, from that point, and I go here, so end up at 9, 20, 1, 0, so 9, 20, 1, 0. Then we bounce again, we end up at 9, 11, 10, then again 9, 11, 0, and I'm going to go speed it up now. You see how the billiards ball is, is bouncing, and you can see the, uh, the cursor progressing here. And we keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going like that. And you can see that eventually, boom, we hit this, uh, we hit the target. Now, once you have the data structure and you have pen and, uh, paper and pencil, then you can say, yeah, I can go there and you can just draw the lines and easily come up with this, uh, with this sequence. This is not a unique sequence. Sometimes you can take a detour, you can go a different direction, right? It will bounce and eventually hit the target. Not, there's not uh, guaranteed to be a, a solution. Um, so let's come up with another puzzle. We have 30, 23, 10. These are the three uh, volumes, and we are seeking 15. So we have to measure somehow about 15 gallons. Uh, the data structure changes a little bit because the volumes are different. So here the, the corner of this parallelogram is cut at a different angle. By the way, this, this data structure could be skewed. You could shift it this way, that way. It doesn't really matter. I just came up with this one because I liked uh, triangles. It doesn't have to be uh, this kind of equilateral triangles. So here we have um, the source again is 30, 0, 0. So we have the 30 gallon full and the other two empty. And we want to hit 15, 15 here. Um, so we start bouncing from here. Now I'm going with orange line. I keep bouncing and 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 bouncing. Keep going like that. Like that, like that, and then we look back to this uh, to the uh, source, and we did not hit this guy. So hitting this, uh, going with a straight line through it is not enough because we don't know where to stop along this horizontal line. We don't know where to stop. We know how to start. We know how to stop here because an event, either one of them fills, or one of them empties. But in the in mid flight, we don't know where to stop. Right. The only way you can stop here is you come from this diagonals from above, and we did not hit those diagonals. Um, well, it turns out that there is like an, another detour that, like a different route that we can take, an alternative fork here, uh, like here, and uh, this one keeps going further. I'm okay, so I was here, then I bounced to here, um, and then it goes back to here and closes the loop, and there's no solution. So I didn't know how to, uh, I didn't have a proof uh, given the three numbers or the three uh, volumes, how do I prove that there is or there is no solution? And that's why I kind of called for, I've called for help with this, I don't know. And actually I have a colleague sitting here that I'll introduce in a moment uh, that she actually has uh, something to share with you on that. But before we get to her, let's move on. Uh, so let's say uh, this is kind of a, uh, an exercise, um, it's a simpler one, so if you want to challenge your colleagues from work, you can say you have three containers, 12, 8, and 5. Uh, initial content is 12, 0, 0, so these two are empty, this is full, and find 6 by 6, 6 by 6. And uh, 
It takes people anywhere from 10 minutes to two days to come up with a solution, depending on their how interested uh, or they are in puzzles and whether this is a puzzle they like. But again, it, it may take some time. If you give them this sheet of paper and say, hey, go from the pink to the green, then they can go very quickly and that's the solution. So there's this uh, seven, eight steps and it leads to the solution. It's cool, right? All right, so let's add another dimension. So we started with two dimensions. We had two containers. Then we went to three, three containers. Now we're going to four containers. I came up with some, uh, some volumes here, let's say with 15, 14, 8, and 7. And we have uh, the, the four, 15 gallon is full, the other three are empty, and we want to measure 10 gallons. How would you do that? So now we have uh, even more, more uh, um, possibilities. So um, I needed to come up with a data structure, and some other co colleagues also helped me, so it's not, it's not all my work. Um, um, so in the previous, in the three, in the three container solution, we had uh, uh, the triangle, right? the equilateral triangle, which was kind of tessellating in, in 2D, right? But uh, here we have four containers, and uh, uh, so let's call them A, B, C, D, and you can pour from any to any in both directions, right? So we have one, two, three, four, five, six. We have six arrows, so we can pour from A to B or B to A, B to D or D to B. That is six, six lines times two is 12. So it's 12 ways you can pour, right? And I needed a data structure that, that represents this 12-way tessellated, tessellated data structure. And um, before I go here, let me show you what it is. So this is a rhombic dodecahedron. Do I hope I pronounced it right. So the rhombic dodecahedron uh, that is, uh, can tessellate in 3D. And uh, a simpler representation is with this dice that uh, I removed every other dice from this 3D lattice. Maybe here, maybe the zoom is here. Um, so this, what you see there on the drawing, represents this structure. So um, we, have, we have this cube drawn around it, and the cube has 12 edges, right? Um, so, for example, this line here represents going from A to C. So we are pouring from A to C, and let's say this is A, B, C, D. So let's say the content of A is 3, 2, 1, 2. So A is 3, B is 2, C is 1, B is 2. And we are pouring that way, we end up in the cube in the middle, and that's going to be a pours into C, so the 3 becomes a 2, and this becomes a 2, and we continue a one, two, 1, 2, 3, 2. So this is pouring from A to C. This way is pouring from C to, uh, C to A. This is pouring from uh, B to D. So B to D is the second number, and the uh, third number actually is from D to B. So here we are pouring from D to B, uh, so here this uh, 3 becomes 2, and this two becomes one, right? So this structure represents um, this structure represents the uh, a proper structure to rep to uh, model uh, finding a solution for uh, four containers. Right. So um, let's say so for the pr the problem that we we started earlier, we say we have um, fifteen. The content of the first container is fifteen the uh, zero, zero, zero for the other three, and we would like to measure 10 gallons. So it, this, this data structure that you see is a three-dimensional lattice of points that are um, similar to these dice, where every other dice is missing. Uh, it's kind of rotating in 3D, it's kind of hard to see. And uh, moving from one cube to another one in any of those 12 directions is, uh, is, uh, represents the event of pouring from one container to another. Um, the, the blue dots are the ones that have um, at least one of the containers is at uh, content 10. So hitting any of the blue dots will give us a solution. Um, and this thing looks like a spaceship. And the way I computed it is I said those are the conditions that on the surface of this the spaceship you have to have one of the containers full or empty. Uh, at the edges two of them, and at the corners, three of them have to have one of these properties. And uh, the sum of the contents of the four containers is always fixed. It's 50, right? Because we, can't, uh, uh, we cannot uh, lose water or gain water, okay? And there's this bouncy uh, brown line 
and like in seven steps, I was able to hit one of these. Um, and so here I'm showing um, that data structure I showed you earlier. I'm kind of rotating, rotating it in 3D. I watched a presentation that was given by Juicy about uh, this jug point problem and he did a really good job of setting up uh, the data structure that he used and uh, what the problem is and um, as a graduate of mathematics the, the interesting thing to me were the, was the, the problem that he posed that he didn't give a solution to which is um, when is it possible to uh, measure out a certain amount in his case it was it was 15 and when is it not possible um, for different values of jug um, and so uh, I consider the question um, what are the conditions on the sizes of the jugs that ensure that you can measure any amount less than the largest jug so I'm just gonna look at this the situation where there are three jugs um, and I'm gonna call them a B and C um, and the conditions on A, B, and C are that A is greater than or equal to B, B is greater than or equal to C, and C is greater than zero with A, B, and C all integers. Um, and so I'm going to uh, explore this problem and give some thoughts on it. Um, the first thing that I'm going to do that allowed me to uh, understand uh, the uh, problem better was to alter the data structure that my colleague used. Um, so he used a, a parallelogram with a truncation on it, and I took that and squashed it so that they were right triangles and it was more of a truncated rectangle. Um, and so uh, you can see this, this is a, um, one of the problems that he showed, and this is converting it into uh, a, the tilted version that I looked at. And so you still have 0, 0, and 12 down here, and, and you can still bounce along um, these vertical and diagonal lines, vertical, horizontal, and diagonal lines, um, and get the same result. Um, and so I'll be uh, switching the data structure up a little bit so that the patterns that I found are more clear. Um, so going back to the example that my colleague showed, um, 30, 23, 10 was the example that he gave that uh, had a, a, a destination that was not possible. Um, and here is uh, 30, 23, 10 as a, a square version, I suppose. And to make it easier to see, I've removed the lines. And you can see that there are definitely lines here um, that we didn't hit and that we started from each of the possible corners and uh, still couldn't hit everything. And so um, the, the thing that I want you to notice in this that will become more apparent on the next slide is um, you can see squares in this problem, uh, repeating squares. Um, and so uh, this is a big square and this is a big square and they look exactly the same. They are, they are copies of each other and um, it, that is in the pattern that the uh, uh, the lines are making. And so if I took this square and I put it on top of this square, the, those lines would match up exactly. And that means um, that all their, their corners are similar. So this one right here has a corner that bounces, um, and, and so does this one. And then at this level, at this horizontal level, this, this square has, has no line that bounces, as does this one. And that, that makes sense because uh, it continues on from, from square to square. Um, so it turns out that since these are the same, uh, bouncing at this corner would be equivalent to bouncing at that corner, which means um, that this is equivalent to the original problem, cutting off one square. Um, and then uh, we can just, instead of bouncing all around here and eventually bouncing back, we can just bounce right here. Um, that means that this is also equivalent. Um, we can just cut off both squares and have the, the leftover. 
Um, and then there's more similar squares. Um, it's a little bit easier to see on these because these are um, smaller squares that it's an exact copy. And we should be able to chop them off too. And then if, if we count, this turns out to be the problem A equals 4, B equals 4, C equals 3, which kind of feels a little bit like a degenerate case because A and B are equal to 4, and see it doesn't have that like, quite the same shape. It's like a whole side got chopped off. But considering A and B being equal is important because we can chop off corners from something where A and B were not equal and arrive at something where they are equal. Um, so the, the claim that I'm making is that solving the problem or determining, determining if uh, all parts of a problem are reachable um, for the problem A equals 3, B equals 23, and C equals 10 is equivalent to solving the problem A equals 4, B equals 4, C equals 3. Um, since the latter can be derived from the former by chopping off squares. And I'll refer to this process of chopping off squares as reduction. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about how reduction works and come up with a mathematical um, definition for it. Um, geometrically, reduction means chopping off squares of size c by c. So going up here, um, notice where we always have to chop off of the smallest side and we define uh, we defined c to be less than or equal to b. So whereas c was originally this large, when we chopped off both those squares, c had to become the smallest edge. Um, um, and so this is, this is the mathematical uh, algorithm for uh, chopping off a side. We, we measure c is equal to, c prime is equal to c, and then we take b prime equal to b mod c, um, and then we calculate a by subtracting off b minus b prime. And then once we have those three numbers, we sort them to get a, b, and c again because those, the orders might have changed. And since c always has to be the, the smallest. Um, and as in the previous example, reduction can be done twice, but it cannot be done more than that. So once you've chopped off uh, squares twice, uh, you're in something called a, a reduced form. Um, so here's an example for the problem we were talking about. We begin with a equals 30, b equals 23, and c equals 10. Um, and then we, we reduce. So we say, okay, c prime equals 10. Following our formula we have up in that corner. And then b prime equals 23 mod 10, which is 3. And then a is equal to 30 minus 23 minus 3, which is 10. So then we have these three numbers and we sort them and we end up with a equals 10, b equals 10, c equals 3. And then we perform the reduction a second time and end up with a equals 4, b equals 4, c equals 3. And I just wanted to point out that, of course, we can see that this problem is not solvable either because there's things that we couldn't hit. All right. Um, so this brings up the question, when can we reduce a problem? Uh, a diagram, rather, or, or a problem. And so one way of phrasing this reduction is we can reduce it when there is a square that we can cut off. We see, okay, c by c square, we'll cut it off if it doesn't run into the side of size. Another way of saying that is when c is small enough. So yeah. All right. Um, so then we arrive at the formula c must be less than a minus c and then just can you start from the top of the page just start yes from the yeah top of the page. okay so the question arises so the question arises when can we when can we make a reduction when can we cut off a square um and so one way that we can phrase this is we can cut off a square when uh there's a square to be cut off uh we can we can reduce when i see this is c and this is a like this is B, and I, I see we can cut off a C by C square, just chop that. Um, another way of phrasing that is we can cut up a square when C is small enough so that cutting up a square won't hit the slanted side. Um, uh, so one thing that I want to point out from this diagram is that uh, A is equal to the length here plus the length until you reach the slanted part. 
and it goes in the other direction too. Um, and that you can you can actually count that up through looking at the or the diagonal lines because there's a diagonal line. Um, and so another way of phrasing this is mathematically as c is less than or equal to a minus c. And then doing algebra, we arrive at 2 times c is less than a. So that means we can reduce when 2 times c is less than a. Um, this means that we can simplify the problem so that we can only look at cases when 2 times c is greater than a. Because if it's, it's larger than or equal to a, then we can just reduce and we'll get a new problem. Uh, let's go on to a new idea by looking at um, the reduced version of 30, 20, 3, 10. Um, so 4, 4, 3 again. So we have, we have this problem, these jugs, 4, 4, and 3, uh, and you can see there's a, um, uh, it's, not, it's not possible because there's a, an area we can't hit. And it turns out that that area um, is a triangle shape. Um, which actually is significant. Um, and that's not surprising. It, it makes sense that you wouldn't be able to measure two with four, four and three. Um, you, can, you can think through that for it. I mean, there's only two jugs. You can only pour so much. You can only pour values of three and one. Um, and then, so it turns out that, thinking about this triangle, that this triangle, um, this unreachable triangle always occurs when the problem is reduced and when A is even. Um, so if A is even, we can divide it by 2, right? Um, uh, and since we know that C is greater than, no, that A is, oh goodness, don't want to say that wrong, that 2 times C is greater than A, since we know that that's true, C will always be above A over 2. And they will not be equal because that's a, a strict inequality. Um, and so the a over 2 will always exist somewhere on the, on the c side. This, by the way, this example is 6, 5, 4. Um, to give another example of a reduced problem with, uh, with uh, a being even. And so um, when we have a minus a divided by 2, we know that b is always greater than or equal to c, so we'll also have a over 2 on this side, right? Uh, or right here and right here. And then it turns out that a over 2 and a over 2 will always meet together at, uh, at the slanted side. Um, and that occurs because, because a is even. Another way of thinking, of thinking about that is if you have a square um, and you draw diagonals on the square, so this is a 3 by 3 square right here, and you draw diagonals on the square. There's two diagonals for each, for each time you go up, right? And there's two diagonals for each time you go over. There's cutting it in half, and there's the one on the end. And there's cutting it in half, and there's one on the end. And that means that counting up to the top of the square is 6. And so you're always just completing that square and creating this triangle that's unreachable. And it's, it's interesting that uh, Juicy happened to uh, pose the, the question that he did about starting with A being 30 and finding 15 because it turns out that uh, A over 2 is something that's hard to, hard to find uh, in, in these problems, harder than other, other values because there are other values that you can reach in this instance um, and it just happens that uh, A over 2 is the one that you can't. Um, so that means uh, that, means that uh, if A is even and it's reduced, uh, the problem is not possible, so then we can go on assuming that A is odd. Um, so to talk about A being odd, I want to go back to the diehard problem that Juicy talked about in the beginning of the problem. Uh, something that I don't think he mentioned, actually, during this presentation is that the diehard problem is always possible if the GCD is 1. Um, and uh, so, so in, in the diehard problem, it's, there's only two jugs, but it's, it's also equivalent to, there is also like a, an infinite tap. And so if A is bigger than B and C, you can just, you can just think of A as kind of like the infinite tap. Uh, and so, so there's no, no truncation, right? Um, and 
So, so in this case, three by five, that is automatically going to be possible because uh, three and five have a GCD of one. Um, okay, and so and so if we have if we have a, a problem looking at this now, not in terms of the diehard problem, but in terms of having jugs A, B, and C or containers rather. Um, this is what it would look like if A is larger than or equal to B plus C, right? We don't ever cap, we don't ever cap B and C. Um, this is what the, the problem looks like when A is equal to B plus C minus one, right? And this is what it looked like for A equals B plus C minus two. And I'm claiming that all three of these have an equivalent solution, meaning that if one of them is possible, then all of the other ones are possible. And if one of them is impossible, then the rest are impossible. Um, so, so why am I making that claim? Um, so the, these two are not so different because uh, this one is just missing this peak. And if you, uh, if you can arrive at this point right here, you can also just, uh, or rather if you can, um, if you, uh, this one, once you arrive here, instead of continuing, you just go right on here, which you would be able to reach anyway. So, cause, cause this, this corner is, uh, you can reach from anywhere actually. So it's not a difficult corner to reach. This, this other one in the case of A equals B plus C minus two um, is similar to this problem because the one point that, that um, the one point that would be questionable to reach, uh, uh, this point in red right here, um, is, re is always reachable um, here if it's reachable here because uh, we go, we'll go on a, a bouncing path like this right here and uh, we'll go on a bouncing path up like that, but instead we'll just truncate it. So that, so that w if you go through this path once, you just go around through, uh, through that path and then continue on your way. So those three uh, problems are um, equivalent. Um, therefore, um, uh, the problem is always possible if the reduction is A is for, uh, is always possible if it is in re reduced form, if A is odd, if the GCD of B and C is equal to one, and if A is larger than B plus C minus two. Um, and again, uh, since these three are equivalent and this is equivalent to the diehard problem, that's why I can make that claim. Um, and if these conditions are not met, then it is not possible. And uh, proving that, I um, haven't completely come, uh, come to a, a proof that that's not possible. I arrived at that by running a computer simulation for many and did not find any. And I, I realized that a, a pattern is not a proof, um, but uh, I'm still working on formalizing uh, that part of a problem. Um, but the part that I have shown um, can be represented in this diagram. Um, we're finding uh, where we start by reducing, and once we reduced, we see if A is even, we check the, BCD, the GCD of B and C, um, and then we go to arrive at it either being possible or not possible. Yeah. <laughs>